welcome to our live uh, episode of Dose of Pharma. I'm your host, Helen. Following the theme of Diversity and Inclusion Week at Monash University, today's topic will be focusing on navigating diversity and building an inclusive clinical environment. Now, without further delay, I would like to welcome our two guests, Zafina and Priyank. Now, first of all, Zafina, would you be able to introduce yourself and how you got to the job that you are in today? Thank you for the invitation. I think it's a, quite an interesting topic to be discussed at the university level and also broadly. Um, I'm a professor of health economics at Center for Medicine, Use and Safety. Um, I joined Faculty of Pharmacy uh, last year and it's been quite a joy to, to spend a lot of time with pharmacists and other healthcare professionals because first of all, I'm trained as a pharmacist. So I started my journey as a, as a pharmacist. Um, but then I got the opportunity to sort of um, work in a setting, in a low and med middle income country setting where um, it was just establishing after the war. So I was able to sort of try to understand the bigger picture of the pharmacy, but also bigger picture of public health. And then I got interested more into public health and understanding who is the payer, who pays for what, how, would, how do we decide to make choices about reimbursement of uh, healthcare technologies that we have in our healthcare system. So that's how I came about to actually have this job that I have by being trained first as a pharmacist, but then taking sort of a more broader approach to looking at the public health and then did a PhD on health economics. Thank you for sharing, Zanifa. Um, that sounds like a, a really long journey going from going into pharmacy and then trying to figure out how, how and what you can do to bring more benefits and contribution to um, the wider community. I think that's such a beautiful thing that you've been doing for these past few years. Um, now, Priyank, are you able to introduce yourself yeah, and sure. um, how did you get to the job that you are today? Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, thanks everyone who's attending um, this event today. So yeah, my name is Priyank Shinoi and um, my journey is similar to Zafina Finals. Um, so I, I'm pharmacist by training as well and I did my bachelor's and master's back in India uh, in pharmacy and I was teaching a bit for, for a year and a half and um, following that I started my PhD in uh, Brisbane, UQ. And um, in so in during my pharmacy bachelor's, master's, I was always inclined towards um, being, you know, oriented towards um, industry funded projects. So I did my internship in um, Serum Institute of India, which is one of the um, largest manufacturers of vaccine in the world, um, and, and other biotechnology companies. And that that's what has given me kind of more inclination towards being, um, you know, associated with um, the research that goes on in industry. Um, I started my PhD in UQ back in 2013 or 14. Um, and that's when I was also associated with one of the, um, back then it was like only six labs in Australia where there was um, NATO accredited um, OECD GLP facility um, supporting the pharmaceutical products um, under the leadership of Professor Marie Smith. So um, I did my PhD there and working with um, um, lovely Nicholas Weldaus from uh, this faculty uh, as well. And um, so I was working on a couple of industry projects there, um, which was, you know, and, and the team, the sponsor was also trying to get those products into the clinical um, trials. Um, so all that background that I had was um, the reason why I had, you know, why I kind of chosen to eventually be in the clinical trials um, profession. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for sharing. Um, so let's get started with our first question. Uh, what would you define diversity as in the health clinical sector? I guess diversity where we work or diversity how we recruit people to work. Um, all right. So in, in terms of diversity, I would say that we have to include people uh, from a different backgrounds, but while we accrue them, we also have to give them opportunities to shine in the same manner as we would give uh, somebody who's born born here. So, obviously, give them uh, 
have a group who is diverse, but at the same time, opportunities that are available, you should equally uh, distribute um, in your group. And um, one of your colleagues just mentioned very nicely, so it's, it's not just uh, diversity and inclusion, but it's equity. And sometimes equity, it's sort of thought differently what it means. But also when you look World Health Organization and all the stuff, they all have different definitions about equity. But I myself, how I understand equity is that, imagine that uh, we have a group of populations split into different socioeconomic groups. But there is a group who is very high here and they probably need very little resources to maintain that status. But then we have a group who is down here to bring that group up here with the same outcomes and same attributes, you really would like to actually increase your expenditures for them to have the same health benefits and same access to the to the healthcare. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, and what about you, Priyank? What do you think? What's your definition of diversity? Uh, like as, as Professor Zanfina responded, it's yeah, it really depends on what you we are referring it to the diversity of the you know patient population with the, within the clinical trials or it's within the you know um, setting of employees. But but more importantly, towards um, the the patients that are pop like the population of patients that are recruited in the uh, in the studies. It's there are different factors that really impact how the um, the, the trial the success of the trial and the marketability. Um, and those factors could be age, um, you know, um, the the biological sex of um, of the patient population um, could be health promoting behaviors or unhealthy, um, you know, like addiction behaviors, um, any you know, alcoholism, etc. Um, could be um, any genetic determinants um, or the genotype, as as you said. Um, a lot of these pregnancy status, like one of the most important things, which has been you know historically overlooked, um, all all these determinants, all these factors, often very important, add to the diversity of the trial population in, in a clinical research setting, which I'm kind of more talking about, and yeah, that that is what I think you know is more about diversity and um, trying to include these sets of population um, to achieve more success and in, in the, uh, you know, in terms of once a product gets into the market, yeah, that, that's what I would perceive it to be. Are you able to talk about the diversity in your sector of health economics and <coughs> clinical trials, perhaps giving some examples or say, what is it currently like and where it can potentially be improved? So we can perhaps start with Zanfina first? Yeah, so um, there is a lot of room from improvement and you already started that discussion. So in, in, in majority of the clinical trials, we tend to recruit very homogeneous populations. And because of that homogeneity, it's very difficult to translate then that information into a larger group of population, meaning that imagine I was just telling an example before. I was recently in Africa and I represent the genomics groups of uh, health economics. And my role is to recruit as many low and middle income countries to participate in this uh, task force. So when you, when you look at what we produce in terms of science and when you look what we produce in terms of recruitment of clinical trials and biobank, we recruit a very homogeneous population. And I'll t give you an example. For example, um, the genome of African people is recruited in only 1%, which means that we don't know 99% what happens in African genome because there are not many uh, ethnic groups included in these clinical trials. But then that will have a consequence in health economics and it will have a large impact into the costs and society because we are doing a clinical trials where there is homogeneous, but then we are applying to the large populations that were not included in the real world practice at all. Um, in terms of where I work, in field that I work, um, of course there are room for improvements in terms of uh, university and 
you are more likely to see uh, male gender in more a uh, in more senior roles than female. But I guess this is changing. But this is something that uh, a lot of studies over the years have shown and have noticed that uh, in Australia and globally, that this is something that we can improve over the years and close this gap. Thank you, Zanifa. And what do you think, Brian? What's your take on that? Yeah, so um, I feel there's a lot of scope and a lot of things that can be done to improve the you know, inclusion diversity within a clinical trial setup. Um, some of the key things that um, I believe, you know, and, and even the industry trends show are that they've started to um, think about the inclusion criteria. Like when I say inclusion criteria, they, they, there are a set of, um, you know, like there are a set of requirements for a patient to be considered eligible for a trial. So um, those criteria need to be carefully thought. Um, th th those need to be broadened. Um, whether there's any possibility to um, change or modify the exclusion criteria for, um, for any trials, uh, or maybe have them modified across the stage of the trial, that would be wonderful. That's one of the ways we could really improve how patients really are able to benefit from being enrolled into the trial. The way we set up a trial, like the design of the trial, that's predominantly, you know, like one of the major things that um, decides how, um, you, you know, how, how we are encouraging participants to be enrolled into a trial and being benefited out of the treatments. Um, and, and specifically, like, especially in uh, fields like cancer and all, the, the, like patients are really waiting for, um, you know, when, when there's really less hope from the medicines that are in the market, they are really in a need and they're really, the families are waiting for them to be enrolled into certain um, new trials that gives them hope of being, you know, um, treated. Yeah, and, and kind of trying to reduce the patient burden if possible. You don't want a patient with, say, for example, you know, in advanced stages of cancer to be visiting a hospital just to conduct a clinical trial procedure more frequently if it's possible to have that frequency reduced. So reduce, by all means, try and reduce the patient burden in a clinical trial setup, design the protocol that way. So all these things, I believe, um, help in increasing or promoting inclusion and, um, yeah, diversity. Mm. So what are the benefits for actively promoting diversity and inclusion in the clinical settings? Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, um, and I believe in Australia, we are facing substantial challenge uh, matching patients' belief, attitudes and care, which means that we are homogeneous, but we are serving a very diverse population, which sometimes we don't know how to deal with. And I guess by promoting diversity and inclusion, this might be a way to close this gap. And but you have to remember that there is no size fits all. This is this is how it should be done. But there is a, a lot of data showing that by increasing diversity and inclusion, you would improve creativity and uh, you would actually be more efficient as a as a company or as an institution. So what do you see as, as the link between diversity and inclusion? I think they go hand in hand. So you have to have a diverse group, but then once you recruit a diverse group, you have to train them and give them the same opportunity to shine. Mm. And what about you, Priyank? What do you think? Yeah, I think the benefits of having you know more inclusion um, involved in a clinical trial setting is kind of, you know, it wasn't as evident before, but now these days, lately, we have seen um, from COVID-19, for example, we have seen how it's affected Native Americans or how it's affected in Australia, old population. A lot of, um, you know, our deaths, unfortunately, have been elder uh, population. So considering all these things, or, or for example, you know, in, in the set of asthma, there are cities, like we live in a quite clean environment here, fortunately, there are cities in the world where the pop pollution levels are quite high. Um, and, and, you know, that promotes asthma. So all these factors that really affect the, you know, the patients where, where the patients are likely to be more for a certain disease of certain therapeutic area, um, it's important for sponsors or, or, you know, the companies that set up clinical trials to consider, you know, to think about these things and have more inclusion of these sects of population uh, within a trial. And that, you know, the, the benefits of doing so are really evident. Like if you 
Um, if you do so, the, the end goal is to have a product that's more marketable to the uh, real world population. So um, that's the benefit. And um, uh, what was your second question again? Sorry. Um, um, so what do you see as the link between yeah. diversity and inclusion? Sure, thanks. Um, so yeah, I think it's just interconnected pretty much. Um, um, yeah, inclusion would be just, just how different parts mm. of like, as I said, these parts, um, you know, make up certain thing like, mm. you know, age, diversity, all, all these factors, whereas just um, that would be the diversity, whereas inclusion is um, how these factors, diverse factors integrate to make something better. So in terms of clinical trial, it's just that if you have population of you know diverse nature um, or, or real representation of the real world, yeah, as I said, it's going to be beneficial for the patients, for the company that actually runs the clinical trial as well. Yeah. So what are some of the successful initiatives or practices that your organization has identified regarding diversity and inclusion issues? Um, I have here in a podium people who work on, on that matter as well. So uh, I'm aware of, of three. One of them is at the university level. So Monash University has put in place equity and diversity inclusion framework, which will run for the next uh, eight, nine years. And Betty, who is here, uh, she's part of the Athena Swan Steering Committee as well. And each group member has to represent and balance between uh, STEM groups. So for example, Betty from Faculty of Pharmacy, but then there are groups from engineering from different backgrounds. So the whole idea of the Athena Swan Steering Group was to bring people from different backgrounds, but also to bring people from different STEM research. So then at the end of the day, we are aware of, of differences, but then at the same time include them in the process of the decision making. At the faculty level, I'm aware of the Faculty and Diversity and Inclusion Committee, which sort of does the same job. And obviously, uh, I'm not uh, I'm not part of it. But um, Betty is here. Maybe she can shine some light what actually this group does. Because I was just talking to people here. I would like to know mo more what that group does, and also I would like to know more how we can at the faculty level, maybe we do more sort of these type of seminars so people understand what this group does and how they can be included or contribute to that steering committee. Do you want to comment, Betty, on the faculty yeah, level? Yeah, restructuring it a little bit. But yeah. Uh, definitely, we want uh, you know, seats at the table from um, different groups, diverse groups, representing um, indigenous population, representing our culturally and linguistically diverse groups, representing LGBTIQ+, um, etc., as well as the student voice, and by that we include HDR students, undergraduate students, etc. Um, and that's a fantastic idea, uh, Zanfina, that we actually um, uh, do more and, um, you know, perhaps have seminars, etc., and really communicate what we're doing as a group. Yes, we're in the uh, process of restructuring it a little bit, so I think I'll stop my commentary there. No, oh, thank you. It was very beautifully explained, so that's why I gave you the, <laughs> the podium to explain a little bit better. Thanks, Safina, and thanks, Betty, for sharing. And um, what about you, Priya? What do you think? Yeah, so, um, so, so I come from ICON, which is, um, you know, one of the largest CROs in the world, and it's got about um, you know, 40,000 uh, employees operating around um, 90 plus countries. So, you know, th there can be organizations like you either, you know, the first step would be just being regulatory, um, you know, comply with the regulatory requirements. Then the next stage would be to uh, think about the visibility, you know, when it comes to inclusion, diversity and equity, think about the reputation and visibility of the organization. But ICON, I believe, is at, at the third stage where you actually, you know, imbibe or um, you kind of incorporate these um, values in their day-to-day -day, um, activities, their day-to-day -day, um, you know, operations. Um, uh, one of the core values of ICON is inclusion, one of the four values. So, um, yeah, so, so we pretty much do everything possible um, to, you know, um, to live this value, um, not, not only in terms of patient, um, you know, diversity in, within a setup of clinical trial, but also within the setup of employees that work on a on a given you know project or within a company yeah
So how can we approach diversity and inclusion for people who are trying to access the healthcare treatment or gain access to some of the clinical trials? Thanks. So last night I, I went home and I did some homework. I was looking uh, systematic reviews and things that have been <laughs> put in practice and some of the data which showed how can we approach diversity and inclusion and access to healthcare and treatment. Um, it shows that improving cultural comp uh, competency and sensitivity of all clinical trial staff, meaning that through training and ongoing personal development, so this was the key. And I guess, obviously, you have to uh, recruit a diverse group into clinical to work in a clinical setting, but also you have to train and give them opportunity. The second one was the need to establish a diverse com com community advisory panel for ongoing input into the research process. So you not only have to sort of recruit people with diverse background, but you also have to create a advisory panel with diverse backgrounds and also increase recruitment of staff from underserved groups. And I think this is one that has to be uh, discussed very broadly because I said we are quite homogeneous the way how we operate. And obviously implementation of this recommendation may help improve underserved groups in clinical trials, which would improve the external validity. And obviously when we think about those, um, we should think about as a society because if we train underserved group, we will have a larger benefits in terms of uh, economy as well. Thank you. Um, and I would love to hear some input from you, Priya. Yeah, so um, I think Professor Zanfina kind of covered it all, even within a clinical trial setup. Uh, one thing I would say that, you know, for, for patients trying to gain access to clinical trials um, that that we could do and as you know sponsor companies and you know regulatory agencies try and promote decentralized trials more and more like um what's happening um you know historically is a clinical trial is you know is, is like a study where patients have to visit hospitals right so to to gain access to um the treatments and to be able to um, receive the care they want to um it's more and more these days recently in the last few years it's been um, advocated that decentralized trials really reduce um, the patient burden um, you know you can have services uh, direct to home services for for example collection of safety bloods or whatever you know trial procedures can be done at home um, all these things are that you know if, if you kind of instead of having all, all the patients to visit the hospital and and do a lot of things uh, there are patients that you know have to travel all the way from regional Australia to to the central hospitals here in you know, you know all the hospitals major hospitals um, fortunately unfortunately are just in uh, you know um, in in a niche area so considering that those options will benefit the patients and will promote those patients um, you know trust and wanting like willingness towards um, um, you know being able to participate in a trial so that's something that could be done to promote um, yeah inclusion so uh, what are some of the ways in which we can do to improve the inclusivity of the practices that are undertaken in your area of work? Maybe we can start with um, Zafina? Yeah, I, I think we, we, we covered some, some of those already. So recruit people with diverse background, but also give them the opportunity of training at the same time. But also, as I said, by um, recruiting and giving the same opportunity, you will definitely be a much more creative company or creative institution and the benefits of it will be realized in, in the future. And I, and I see that these two sort of creating opportunities and opening the doors for diverse groups or underserved groups, um, for example, Potentially, Monash University can have a more um, diverse or have a group who does research potentially only on uh, Aboriginal health or who looks more specifically into the use of medication of our Aboriginal health. For example, are they, do they have the same compliance? Are they included in the same clinical trials? 
So we're giving them the medications, but we don't know if those patients are actually included in clinical trials or do they or are they part of the evidence-based decision-making? They are part of usage in a real world, but uh, so that's why actually putting research in place and allowing this underserved group to be uh, taken in consideration for evidence then potentially could improve diversity and inclusion at Monash University. Would you like to add anything? Yeah, so, um, you know, improving inclusion and diversity in a given setup is, um, in, in clinical trial field, is more about, like, I think this, there's a lot of work that requires to be done by sponsors here, by the companies that run clinical trials. And, and these have been, the efforts are clearly evident in um, recent few um, years. Um, one of the examples I would quote is, um, you know, top pharma players like Johnson & Johnson and Merck, they've come together with a coalition called 110. If you Google 110, um, this, you know, such coalition programs are designed, like for example, 110 is designed towards having more, you know, people from diverse color to be um, operating at sites or hospitals, um, you know, or, or in, in industry setup, where patients see the staff who are involved in recruiting them to be of their own um, cultural background or, you know, um, if, if they feel um, related to them, there's more trust that patients develop because, you know, there's a, sometimes there can be stigma around clinical trials, like how, you know, how many of us have really um, enrolled into a clinical trial before. Um, so it's for that to be able to the trust building and to the transparency, all these things will be developed if you know, you have connection towards the staff who are actually sitting on the front of the table and trying to convince you to get, you know, enroll into a clinical trial. So such such coalition programs, such efforts at the policy level um, will really help improve, um, yeah, the inclusion and diversity in the setup, I believe. Thank you, Priyan. And thank you, Zenfeda, for some very insightful inputs for today's discussion. Um, thank, thank you very much for your time and effort for being here today. I hope that uh, through our conversation today, our audience can gain more understanding in terms of diversity and inclusion, and then we can think, of, uh, we can think about it, and then we can have some approaches and strategies to apply it and take actions and to do it as a collective society so then we can promote more diverse and inclusive treatment in the clinical setting so that everyone can all have a chance to have access and receive the right healthcare treatment that's suitable for them. And thank you very much, our audience, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for organizing. Sosa Pharma acknowledges the traditional custodians of the various lands throughout Australia on which we connect today and pays respect to elders past, present and future. Thank mm -hmm. you.